Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, Leader Dermody, and your Democratic leadership team, Majority Whip Cutler, and our Republican leadership team, to all the members of this body, Republican and Democrat, and especially to the people of the 62nd Legislative District in Indiana County, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for allowing me to serve you. Thank you for allowing me to lead you. I came to this building for the first time as an eighth grader at Homer Center Junior High School on our class trip. And I don't remember a ton about that trip, but I remember just being in awe of the beauty and the majestic nature of this building. And I remember seeing for the first time the plaque that when you walk into the Capitol Rotunda marks where Teddy Roosevelt stood when he dedicated this building in October of 1906. Many of you know that's still my favorite place in the Capitol today. But I remember just thinking of the history and all the people that had served in this building over the years and how such a wonderful testament it was to our great republic. I would come back a number of years later as a junior at IUP and an intern for the Ridge administration, and I would take the bus each day three miles down 3rd Street to the bottom of the Capitol steps, walk out of the bus and up those steps, and would always pause and take note of the flag flying above the rotunda and Lady Commonwealth looking down upon the city. It's something I still do every morning when I walk into this building. And then I would come back a couple years later, after beginning my first campaign at the age of 22, knocking on 11,000 doors, defeating a 12-term, 12-year incumbent in a district that was only 37% Republican, I would come into the hall of this house for the first time as a 24-year-old kid as a legislator well before I was prepared to be a legislator. There are so many folks who've given me such a grand opportunity, an opportunity of a lifetime to participate in our democratic process, to debate the policy issues of our times, and to meet so many fascinating and wonderful individuals. As I look back to the journey and the opportunities I'll be given, they all start with my parents. My mother, Connie, and my father, Don, couldn't be here today. But they set the path for my sister and I very early in life. They are a testament to what the pursuit of the American dream looks like. Every time they got knocked down, they got back up. They raised my sister and I right to believe that with hard work, and if you actually do play by the rules, you respect one another, have a little bit of common sense, and don't expect anything to be given to you, that dream can be yours. They worked hard and sent my sister and I to be the first in our family to go to college. To my staff, and I'm going to name them all, I'd just appreciate it if they wait till the end and we can recognize them at the end, but we all know that we put our names on a ballot, but it's them that make us the elected official. They serve our communities just as much, if not more, than we do. I have had a tremendous staff, both here in Harrisburg and back in the district. From Taylor Steele, who is that bright, shining, optimistic face you see when you walk into the majority leader's office, to Cheryl Griffiths, who may be one of the most kind and caring individuals who I think she believes I may be her other son that she must take care of every day. To Steve Miskin, my communications director, and Steve served our caucus as communications director before me and probably will do so after me. But the unique part about Steve is he doesn't just look for talking points and sound bites 
He actually cares about the policy behind them. You just don't find that in PR folks in today's world. To Marsha Lampman. Marsha, most folks know Marsha in one form or another, and they know she is tough as nails. She is a bulldog, but she is the most loyal person I have ever met. To Matt Hilliard. Matt is an attorney on my staff in the majority leader's office, but I've known Matt since I was in elementary school. We grew up together in Homer City, went to Homer City United Methodist Church together. He was the first intern on my first campaign when he was a senior at Homer Center High School. He came back to intern in the legislative offices while attending Washington and Jefferson and then the University of Pittsburgh Law School and came to work to me when I was policy chairman. I've never met a brighter, more meticulous individual than Matt Hilliard. To Tony Aliano, Tony and I first met when I first came to this Capitol as a 24-year-old legislator, and he was chief of staff to then Majority Whip Sam Smith. And both Sam and Tony always looked out for me all of these years. They would always try to steer me in the right direction, pull me back when I'd gone just a bit too far, and try to make sure my life, professionally and personally, was headed in the right direction. And I think if it's one thing most of us in this Capitol can agree upon, Republican, Democrat, House, Senate, the whole way up to the governor's office, Tony is the one person in this building that knows how to get things done. He makes the possible possible, even when we thought it was impossible. To my district staff, Jen Verado has been with me from the very beginning. In fact, she came over from former Representative Jeff Coleman's staff. She has been the one in the district to always make sure that my priorities were right, that I was focused on God, family, and then work and that my family was doing just as well as I was doing professionally. From Shannon Lauer, Shannon's been with us for a number of years, and Shannon is best described as the funny one, the scrappy one, the one who works her tail off, and the one who just makes the office a pleasure to come to every single morning. And Adrian Smochak, who could not be with us today, somebody had to actually man the district offices, but Adrian's been in charge of all my events, scheduling, and making sure everybody's in the right place at the right time while raising two young children of her own. And Jonathan Longwell. John has been my chief of staff, my district director, my policy advisor for 14 years. I was 26 when I hired John and he was 25. John's been the one who has served Indiana County just as much as I have. And over the years, folks have realized they don't always need to talk to me. Talking to John is just as good as talking to me. John, you've done a tremendous job. I'm proud to see how you've grown professionally. I'm even more proud to call you my friend. I also have several former staffers with me today because, as I'm told, there is life outside this building. Jessica Blair, who still works in the House, who served with me in the Majority Leader's Office, and Tom Brysiak, who was my Executive Director of the Policy Committee and then Chief of Staff as Majority Leader. I don't think I've ever met anybody who works as hard as Todd and as anybody could tell you, chief of staff to the majority leader is not the easiest job. But to see him do it while going home every night and helping his young daughter fight childhood cancer was an amazing testament to his strength and fortitude. And finally, from a staff perspective, Pam Albert. Pam has been my gatekeeper. She's been my secretary for 14 years in Harrisburg. She's been my protector. She's always looked out for me and sometimes nobody else. Many of you know Pam's struggles over the years, losing two young sons 
well before their time to childhood disease. I've never seen a more courageous, faith-based woman in my life than Pam Albert. Every time she could have got knocked down, she got back up. And she continues to lead her life in spite of her family's tragedy to try to ensure that other families don't experience that same tragedy. She is the reason I believed or came to believe that we should legalize medical marijuana in this state. You all made it happen. In my family, a lot of folks enter this sort of profession and your family is thrown for a tailspin because your life changes dramatically. This is all my family's ever known. I met my wife, Heather, after I was already in this position. Our three children were born into a life in the public purview. As I exit this building, it will not just be a change in profession, but it will be a change in life for the five of us. My wife has been an amazing partner in every aspect of the work, professionally, personally. She makes me better every day. And for those of you who know her, you can attest, she is the extrovert. I am the introvert in the family. She works full time, raises three children, keeps me focused, volunteers to coach our kids' swim team and softball teams, and serves a number of community organizations. She is our very own Wonder Woman. And our three children, Joshua. I still remember when Joshua was born just over 10 years ago, and I came to this floor of the house the week after, and I remember walking down the middle aisle to my seat and realizing just how big the magnitude of the decisions we were making were. Because up until that point in my life, I knew they would affect me, myself, and I in our lifetime. But once I held him in my arms, for the very first time, I knew we were making decisions for his lifetime as well. Buddy, it's been amazing to watch you grow into such a, a strong, kind, bright, athletic young man. Your mom and I could not be prouder of you. Our middle daughter, Gracie. Gracie's always the smiling face and the blonde, curly, beautiful hair. She's one of the most kind and caring young ladies I've ever met. She's also the fiercest competitor in the family. She'll smile at you right until you walk between the lines and once the competition starts, she's going to seek to destroy you. <laughs> Gracie's also the reason I've chosen to go in the direction I am going to go in the next chapter of my life. I came to the Capitol, I think the third week of June, and found on my desk a handwritten letter that had been mailed to me from her. It simply said, Dear Dad, I miss you very much. I love you. I hope to see you soon. Love, Kreiser. At that point, I knew whatever I did next, I needed to be able to tuck them into bed at night more often and wake up with them in the morning every day. And I think you'll see that reflected when it's announced tomorrow what I'm going to do next. They are going to be my next priority. And then finally, Ellie. Eliana Jane is our youngest, tiniest, 
beautiful little girl. She is also one of the toughest children I think I have ever met. She is so full of personality and spunk. She makes you want to laugh and cry and hug her and run the other way all at the same time. But she completes our family and she fills our heart every day. You know, the last year, the last year has been a bit of a roller coaster ride for our family. I woke up on January 1st running for re election to the House of Representatives. On January 2nd, Congressman Schuster announced his retirement. A couple weeks later, I would enter the race for Congress. By mid March, I was exiting politics completely. Now, I had a little bit of help from the state in the United States Supreme Court, but from the very day I entered this body to the very day I exit, I firmly believe in my heart of hearts, as much as we want to dictate the life and the path before each of us, it's not ours to dictate. There's a plan, it's not ours, but the Lord above holds that plan for us. And I am so thankful for the path he has given our family. Now, when you know you're about to leave this body, particularly when you have six months to think about it, and you are about to leave on your own terms, you have plenty of time for reflection. And I've had plenty from a personal, from a professional, and a political perspective. And a lot of people like to ask me questions. One of the top questions has been, what do I think of today's political climate? What do I think of that climate? And where do I think our political environment is going next? Look, I, I don't think it's any mystery that a person like myself, who tends to be more pragmatic than ideological, I'm perhaps not of the right mindset to be a partisan legislative leader during these very partisan political times. Because you see, I think today's political environment is very, very personal. I think it's very, very negative. I think it's very, very aggressive. And as personal as it is, I don't think it's very personable. I don't think folks take enough time to get to know each other individually. As the saying goes, far too often in politics today, we, we choose to judge a book by its cover and, ever, and always fail to read its contents. I think if folks spent more time learning about the individual and less time fighting over differences, we would actually find that there's more that unites us that actually divides us. And I also don't think it has to be that way. Folks, particularly on the cable news networks, are prone to say, look, these are the leaders we have chosen. The voters have made the decision. They get the government, the elected officials, and the political environment they choose and they deserve. I don't believe it. And I don't think you should either. You see, I think that's a backwards way of looking at leadership. It's actually incumbent upon each of us, whether being in a formal elected position, a community, a business leader, a little league coach, a dance instructor, a teacher, young and old, it's incumbent upon each of us to set the example to set the standard of conduct. It's through our tactics, it's through our actions, it's through our leadership or lack thereof that the tone of our political environment will be set. That political be environment should be reflective of our leadership. Our leadership should not be reflective of the political environment. You see, it's actually okay. It's okay to disagree. 
It's okay to have different views on an issue. It's okay to still appreciate another's perspective that you don't agree with it and actually still like that person. Folks don't have to demonize one another to make their points on policy. One of the other questions I'm often asked is, what do I believe after 16 years in this body? What is the accomplishment I'm most proud of? How do I wish to be remembered? Now, it's an odd question to be asked when you're 40 years old, how you wish to be remembered, but it is food for thought. And as I think through that question, the first thing that dawns upon me, and you know, I think a, a couple of you will understand this more than others, when you exit this body in one of the upper echelon positions, you don't get to get judged on your entire tenure here. You really are only judged on your time with the ball in your hands. So it's really 16 years condensed into four. And as I think back to my time and what I am most proud of, we've accomplished a lot, sometimes in spite of ourselves, but you look at the last four years, a lot of things have actually happened. A Republican House, a Republican Senate, a Democratic governor, if you look at the actual policies that were implemented, I think it's fair to say the last four years have been the most aggressive four years in the last quarter century. Unfortunately, a lot of it's overshadowed by the petty bickering and divisiveness of the national political environment. But you should each know, you helped make those things happen. And of course, there are things I'm very proud of back home. Just in the last six months, luring urban outfitters in a 900,000 square foot facility to our community, the single biggest economic development project in over five decades to hit Indiana County. Finally, rehabilitating Yellow Creek State Park and acquiring the funding to rebuild the domestic violence shelter at the Alice Paul House. But really what I'm most proud of and how I wish to be remembered is how I conducted myself in this job. I always try to remain true to the people who sent me here, whether they voted for me or not, because we are actually entrusted to represent 64,000 people, not just 50% plus one that actually voted for us. I held over 100 town hall meetings, knocked on doors, in election years and non-election years alike. And more than anything else, I always sought to conduct myself, whether it be as a 24-year-old rank-and-file member to a 40-year-old majority leader, with honesty and integrity. And if I gave you my word, I would do everything in my power to see it through to the end whether it was painful for me or not. I truly believe that each of us, we approach this job with good intentions. I don't think there's a bad person in this place who comes to Harrisburg that does not seek to represent their 64,000 people. It just so happens it's a pretty diverse state. Your 64,000 people are different than my 64,000 people. We have different perspectives, different priorities. But I think each of you, like I, wake up each and every morning and you're bound and determined to do the right thing for the right reasons to the benefit of this entire state. Now, that doesn't mean the stars always align. It also doesn't mean I'm right and you're wrong or you're right and I'm wrong. More often, what it actually means is we just have different perspectives on a set of goals that we all actually share at the end of the day. You know, we each entered the political arena wanting to live out our founder's vision for this country, for this republic. And it's an amazing vision that came to light a couple hundred years ago, a couple hundred miles from here. You know, the founders of this country wanted a nation, wanted a government, wanted our citizens 
to have the very basic freedom to stand and scream at the top of their lungs that of which they believe, to fight for their policies to their dying breath. Something a lot of people take advantage of in today's world. But I think all too often, we forget, our nation forgets, those same founders had a second component to that vision. You see, when they were done yelling and screaming, when they got off their soapboxes, when they were done fighting and debating, they actually sat around a table, put some differences aside, compromised, and they formed a country. And when you think about it, if they can fight the British, fight each other, then form a nation, it sure seems there's a lot of hope that if our elected leaders take from that example and do the same, a lot of the issues that folks have talked about for the years can actually find solutions. You see, compromise is not actually a bad thing. In fact, it's the only way to move a state like Pennsylvania forward by working together for the betterment of all. When I first started my tenure as majority leader in January of 2015, I started with a quote from Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart was born and raised in Indiana County and probably most famous for his role as George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life, but I took a quote from Senator Jefferson Smith in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And that quote on that day was, I wouldn't give two cents for all of your fancy rules if behind them they didn't have a little bit of plain, ordinary, everyday kindness and a little looking out for the other fella too. Well, as I'm about to end my tenure as your majority leader, I want to borrow another quote from the same movie. And it's a discussion between Senator Smith and Senator Payne. Senator Payne was the senior senator from their state. Senator Payne had come to Washington, D.C. as a young, idealistic senator only to be corrupted by the city and the political machine. But they had a conversation about lost causes. And in that conversation, Jefferson Smith said to Senator Payne, I guess this is just another lost cause, Mr. Payne. All of you people don't know lost causes. Mr. Payne does. He once said they were the only causes worth fighting for, and he fought for them. For the only reason any man ever fights for lost causes, because of one plain, simple rule, love thy neighbor. And in this world today of great hatred, a man who knows that simple rule garners great trust from all. Lord knows during my time in this body, I've fought for my share of lost causes. Some have even been successful. Others are going to be left to you all to pursue. But as the pages turn from one chapter in my life to the next, I just want to encourage each of you, seek out and find your own lost cause. Give your time here purpose. Accept the challenge of pursuing something greater than yourself to the very, very end of your tenure. Be worthy of that distinction you now hold in the history books of this commonwealth. And as you do so, live every day with the kindness of George Bailey in your heart and the courage of Senator Jefferson Smith in your soul. Good luck, and may God bless each and every one of you, your families, our great state, and this wonderful nation of ours. Thank you.